the record button is going. So um, can I just say um, thanks ever so much, Teresa, for um, agreeing to uh, join us today and talk about your coaching experiences um, and how you've developed and how you, you reflect and, and how you're moving forward in the future. Um, hopefully all is good up in Donegal with you. Yeah, on uh, my only challenge at the moment is, <laughs> is my 5K restriction, which I um, do. I am adhering to and sticking to the rules, but um, I, I'm finding it quite hard because I tend to walk a lot on the beach and, and I tend to have, I'm missing that. But otherwise, I'm good. Good, good, good. And um, we, 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 I think we were just saying before we start this record that, that sometimes, you know, when you're reflecting, um, you are elaborating on that. Excuse me. Okay. I certainly wasn't expecting a telephone call, but there you go. I, don't no. know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to shut it up other than just uh, turn it off. <laughs> so go on, you were saying you were reflecting there. Yeah, I'm just, I was just kind of saying, I suppose, really, I suppose my own learning, um, you know, and, and when you think particularly around that quest, you know, you were, we were talking about sort of, you know, how do you develop as a coach? And, and I suppose certainly for me, a lot of it, you know, reflective practice would have been a big thing for me and, and reviewing. And I say, you know, you review, you learn and you adapt if necessary sort of thing. Like, um, and, and I've been very fortunate to be part of um, um, Sport Ireland, the Performance Excellence Programme, where we did a lot of work on that. Um, I think, too, for me, I continue to read and ask questions. And, you know, if I see a performance and I, and I think that's something a bit different then I'll go and I'll make contact with that person and I suppose down through the years you know I've seen um, say for example I had an athlete that was actually Darren McBerty that went to the Europe as a 19 18 year old went to the European indoors and and went through the semi-final and um, the 800 meters was uh, won by I think um, Kashat and Lemondowski was second and I thought right I want to know what's going on there sort of thing like so you know I kind of between a few different people I knew I sourced out Thomas Lemondowski who was coaching the guys and you know would have made contact with him and would have met him and would have talked to him and did things like that and and different people that I would have had like I would have you know that George Gandhi was was a source that was very helpful to me around altitude training and um, the likes of Norman Poole and you know and even initially, when funny when I started, and I would consider myself a science-based coach, I was really fortunate to uh, come across Giles Warrington as as a physiologist, which was was massive. So I think, you know, always as a coach, you need to be curious and always ask. And you know, your preferred way of learning, and certainly mine, would be to talk and to sort of find out. And I would read a lot. I would still continue to read quite a lot. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm, I don't know if somebody is desperate to get hold of me, but I've, uh, <laughs> I'm not available. Uh, <laughs> there we go. You're otherwise engaged tonight. Uh, I think, too, just on that as well, too, um, bashes around, you know, I think you need to, for me, I suppose I've learned, um, you know, I, I'm a big, one of my other things is very much planning as a thing. So if you make a plan, and I think if you have that plan and you go back to that plan, if you're not sure if you hit a crossroads or something doesn't work out, then if you go back to the plan, you'll find it there. And I think, you know, I've learned to trust myself. Um, and interestingly, one time I had to do an exercise as part of a program where I had to write my philosophy. And I I didn't know I had one until I actually wrote it down. So, you know, certainly that's something, even if it's only a case of writing down five or six bullet points and sort of what exactly your philosophy is. So when you come to a decision and you're a wee bit confused and you're under a bit of pressure and um you know i think that that certainly helps and um you know so there, was, there was a case um one time where i had it was actually when i was coaching mark english and it was the world championships in moscow and i, I came under serious pressure there in relation to mark had the had the, the b standard and there was a whole sort of a saga going on online and so on about himself and paul robinson should be race off at nationals and so on you know and you know that I was coming under pressure from lots of different sources around that. But what I did, I went back to my plan and the plan was always that Mark was going to run in London on the Friday night and come and run the 400 metres and nationals and not do the 800. And, and despite the pressures from a lot of sources, I stuck to that plan and he went out and he ran, you know, a PB the Friday night in London and, 
came and fulfilled as as um, you know nationals and ran the four hundred. So I do think that if you have that, you know, you learn to trust yourself too. I think. Absolutely agree with you. Um, you you you've got to have a philosophy and, and stick to your guns and uh, and realise you know perhaps when your philosophy or your own philosophy doesn't necessarily match that of your athletes or or, or the people that you're working with. But by being aware of it, then you can adapt accordingly. Uh, so, so yeah, mm. I, absolutely agree. So so I think some of the questions you've got down here. I, I say um, as a coach, um, what are your main coach processes that you focus on? You know, so um, are there three areas that you might elaborate on yeah like i would always describe myself as, as a science-based coach i've never coached really any other way um and I, I don't you know i just don't understand anybody from an endurance point of view that uh that coaches without without using science and as i say back when i started coaching and i started you know um years ago i started coaching gary cross and who went on to be the, a national marathon uh, winner I think four to four five times but um, and at that time I remember sourcing out the likes of Giles Warrington so very much you know science based lactate test, t- testing your heart rate monitors uh, for your you know tempos is one of the most abused terminology I think in any of our, any of our, our language and you know you don't really know what you're doing unless you're, you're doing that and certainly things like monitoring and you know I think consistency is big in that sense and I think if you know we can get um, carried away and not be controlling and not listen to our bodies enough like um, the other thing I would say if there was there's three things for me and that would be the science the lactate test and and or using a heart rate monitor and you know there's other ways around it if you don't have access to lactate test and you can do that you can do a, a, a test yourself and you can have at least start somebody off in that way uh, functional movement would be the other one and injury prevention like if you're going to put an effort into coaching or an athlete is going to put effort into training then certainly things like um, injury prevention or what I would call prehab and, and I suppose I've been very lucky to work with some fantastic physios and s and people down through the years that I have I've learned so much myself and I think for me and particularly that age group of you know the younger age group uh, planning and goal setting is just so important and um, I think it's again there's pressures maybe are coming from from club and from different places and um, parents and that but you know you need to have a plan and then you need to work back from that plan and you know have your phases and not just be you can't expect particularly that age group to turn up and do absolutely everything and again you know they need balance in their life their friends and their social life are very important to them and, and I think too, obviously their studies. So you know, I do, again, that I suppose that's my three things, you know, science, functional movement, and and planning. Gotcha. And I think too, I would always ask the question. I suppose for me, um, you know, do, does it? I'm always saying if anybody comes up with any, oh, did you hear about this or do you know this? I say, well, does it make you run any faster? And if it doesn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested. Basically, so everything is coming into that. That sort of kind of main the main goal. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and and I mean I mean you've you mentioned science. Um, are, you, are you from a science background yourself? Is that no? But I would be um, no. And and now what I'm saying I'm also I'm going to contradict myself now because I'm saying I would be quite holistic as well. I would believe in the whole you know the whole body that science. I just think science produces um, or certainly the likes of a heart rate monitor as a very useful tool that we can use. Um, sometimes I kind of like a joke and I say maybe I'm just a lazy coach because um, you know I don't I never can understand why people say oh you need to go and run at this certain time or that time and you're thinking well what if you didn't sleep very well last night or what if it was blown a gale or what if you're not recovered so you know just just I suppose really by nature I would be um, practical I suppose maybe which is maybe draws me to science and I like things to be I like to know where I'm at. And I think, I think yeah, I think what, I, what I'm hearing, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's a fair amount of monitoring and measuring in, in your plan just to keep sure, make sure that people are on track. Um, yeah, and even I think it's too, it's, it's, it's an education around that. Um, it's not that, you know, I'm very much, and I do believe that, you know, um, coaching is um, making your athletes self-sufficient, that you're teaching 
as a coach, like certainly that that'll be my style of coaching. You explain things and you're helping them become uh, empowered almost and, and self-sufficient that they can learn then to read their own body, that they can use, you know, tools like checking your heart rate, your resting heart rate or checking how you feel. And that allows you then you can see the, the practicalities and the sense then of, well, you know, if I'm absolutely wrecked, then is there any point in me training today? Maybe I should wait until tomorrow and... Yeah. Uh, you know, but I think it's very much an education. Yeah, coaching an element of independence because yeah, I guess in the, the heat of the battle, they're out there on their own, they've got to make that split second decision that can make all the difference. But, uh, yeah, and I think too, even for that, um, you know, I often think, I, I suppose it's always been my style of coaching, but, you know, for an athlete to do and to commit to, say, a training program and to competition, and particularly for the age group that we're talking about, you know, they're doing maybe things that they're they're not doing things rather their friends are doing that in order for them to get that buzz out of it, they have to have, you know, they have to have some control and they have to be able to sort of kind of really um, have the right nearly to kind of make, make some of those decisions themselves based on the right education, I suppose. Yeah, n- nurturing and, and, and yeah, I know I sometimes think that while I'm coaching an athlete, I'm actually to some degree I'm coaching the parents as well. So that everybody buys into the program and they can, you know, nudge the athlete onto the right pathway. And uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah. And, I, and I've had my I've had my fair share of dealings with parents. There, there's no doubt about it. And and some have some have been good and some haven't been good. But um, I think that at the end of the day, if you are, you know, it is it's a team effort, and parents are a massive, massive, massive part of that team in terms of not only in terms of training, in terms of understanding or you know, there's no point in you having access to an athlete a couple of times a week and then them going home and the parents not understanding the philosophy and they're, you know, contradicting what you're saying. And, and you Absolutely. know, let's face it, you yeah. know, they need they need a bit of support in terms of like they're their uh, parents are their sponsors, uh, essentially. And even in terms of, you know, for that age group as well, in terms of their nutrition and in terms of their energy needs, in terms of food and all that, it's very much... Um, you know, and, and, I, and I've been very fortunate and a lot of the times to have really good uh, relationship with parents and that we would very much work as a team. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, sometimes the most important part of the team because they spend, you know, anything from 12 to 14 hours a day with uh, the athlete that you, you might get to spend two hours a week um, on a regular basis. But, but yeah, lots of really good points there, uh, Teresa. Thank you. Um, the next question I've got for you is... Um, which areas are you focusing on to develop as a coach presently? Um, because nobody knows everything. So uh, are there any areas that you're working on at the moment? Yeah, I think, you know, I suppose, for, I think the main thing for me always would be reflective practice. And, you know, that you're, and I think that's that's maybe is, maybe not the danger. I think too, when you get to a stage, like say for the likes of me, that that's quite experienced and you, you need to be careful that, oh yeah, that's, I know what I'm doing and you don't sort of kind of look any further than that. Um, I think too, the other thing is, you know, it's a very old saying, you know, you coach, you don't coach the event, you coach the athlete and different things work for different athletes and depends on where that, that athlete is in their life, you know, you have to sort of kind of change things around that. Uh, and definitely I would continue, you know, myself to read and I would definitely, you know, ask questions and, and I think too, you know, when all else fails, um, I go back to the basics and I go back to fundamentals and then I notice myself going back to stuff even that I would have, you know, kind of read years ago. And I go back and I look at that again and I was like, God, you know, I've kind of forgotten that and I must read it. So, and the other thing I'd be kind of mindful of, um, I suppose to have, you know, I have a couple of coaches that I would have great respect for and great trust in them, but I do think to, um, you know, seek your, seek your advisors wisely and look at your coaches and look at your mentors that are consistently producing athletes successfully. And, and that, that's, you know, we just be very mindful about where you get your advice and where you take your, your, your information from sort of thing like, and, and I do, I'm always looking at like, certainly that, um, like some of the webinars that, um, Athletics Northern Ireland did over the, first lockdown and you know I'd be a good fan of the likes of Gareth Stanford and always interested you know to see what he has to say and 
I've been very fortunate to to have exposure to uh, the likes of Niall Moina and DCU would have helped me immensely, um, even in the provision of of the services of DCU around testing and so on. But um, you know, I would go back to sort of some of that fundamentals and basics every so often as well too. Gotcha. And, and, and just going back to some of, you know, some of the people you might have reflected or, or used the sounding boards. I, I mean, you mentioned uh, Norman Poole, George Gandhi and, and Thomas. And, and interestingly, I know all three of those and, and most recently I was trying to get Thomas over uh, to, to, to do what I'm doing with you right now, but I've not managed yeah. to as of yet. But, um, but what, any, any nuggets that, that, you, that they gave you or shared with you? Um, I think, well, actually, it's interesting and I suppose maybe... Um, without sounding a little bit kind of um, uh, too big for my boots. It was very interesting. I'll take, for example, the likes of Norman Poole. I was in a situation one winter where I had, uh, here in Donegal, it was one of our particularly bad winters. So there was, we had basically no facilities to train and there was one road on um, and around town that we trained on. And I literally did every kind of hill, hill, hill strides, acceleration runs, every kind of thing on that because it was only one place and it's turned out the group that I had at the time went out and I think in their first indoor race ran you know three or four qualifying times an Irish record and I thought I'll be doing this again this will be in my program now forevermore man and I went over then I remember going over to a symposium in uh, Norman Pool um, in Manchester probably and it was very interesting. He talked about, um, you know, using things like, um, I can't think of his name now, his, his name escapes me right now, the 800 meter runner that he used to coach. Um, the guy used to always wear his t-shirt. <laughs> That's, um, yeah, Michael Rimmer. I know he's talking about Michael. And, uh, so anyway, he, um, and he talked about him and the use of, you know, even a stride, say the week of a race, he liked to do them on a hill for different reasons. And I was kind of going, oh, this is great. <laughs> I figured that out for myself. But I think too, a lot of the time, I think, you know, when we do know, and sometimes I just think it's really, really valuable when you hear other coaches and other people that you are doing well and they're having similar types of philosophies or similar, similar types of sessions or similar types of ideas that you're having. I think it's a great source of, you know, um, confidence to hear that other people are doing something similar to yourself too. So um, you know, the likes of George Gandhi was a massive support. I was lucky enough to go out one time and do a piece of work on altitude training. And um, at that time, uh, the British were doing a huge amount in Fontremeau. And again, just, you know, getting that um, out to Fontremeau and did a piece there. And, and it was just great to get that almost, you know, access and, and to be able to answer, ask questions and answer them and that type of thing. So I suppose often too, you know, where I felt that I've, had maybe a gap or something that interested me, I would have followed that without sort of kind of having um, anything, you know, I would have really had a specific question for somebody. Um, um, like I remember one time a question, Alan Story asking him, um, and it was a very specific question about, um, you know, when you win, sometimes when you can't get, um, if it's hard to get your heart rate elevated in a session, what was the reason for it? And, I, and I, I tried a few different places to get that question answered. And, you know, he, he was the guy that was able to answer it for me. So um, I suppose I would, if I have a question, that's, and I do I do tend to think a lot and I do consider a lot in terms of uh, training and schedules and all that. So, you know, when, when something comes up or something comes into my head that I'm trying to find an answer to it, then I'll, I'll source the best source that I can get. Reflecting, reflecting, reflecting. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, and um, thinking about uh, your support crew, and um, I mean, you mentioned some of your mentors, and um, who, who is in your support crew when you're coaching these days? Uh, well, I'm very lucky and always have been. Uh, my husband, who a lot of people will know, has uh, been involved. He's involved in athletics too, so you know he's, he's very educated around athletics um and i suppose we, we have a great balance in it that he's very much you know he's, he's, he's totally and absolutely an official and always will be and many's a many's a disagreement we do have about things around that end of things but um but yeah massively like he will um you know he'll always listen and, and i think it's great to have someone that you can trust so much and understands as well too what you're talking about 
um, you know, so that would be somebody that, um, and obviously, you know, my family as well. And um, and down through the years, the likes of Mark Kirk, um, as somebody who I would trust. And, you know, I remember going to Mark with something one time and I was coming under pressure about a decision about an athlete. And Mark was somebody I talked to and, you know, he told me exactly what I needed to hear. And that was, you know, go back to the plan. Look at it. What did you, what did you decide, you know, six months ago, what you were going to do? And um, the likes of myself and Robert Den Mead, I was actually talking to Robert today, uh, would, 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 would talk regularly as well too. And, um, but um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's, and I think there's an element of that to yourself. You have to be, you know, you have to learn. I think you do learn that wee bit of confidence as you as you continue to coach and and you become your own support crew. Gotcha. And, and in terms of sports scientists, um, and I know you've mentioned down at DCU, but but more locally around uh, the Donegal area, is, is there uh, two or three people that you might use there for sports science? Yeah, well, I'm um, I'm very I'm absolutely very lucky um, that I have uh, the wonderful uh, Danny Mooney who um, I coach but um, is also a sports science, a scientist. And, uh, you know, Danny's a massive resource to have. And even in terms of, I'm very fortunate actually in a couple of things because my daughter is a, a nutritionist. So I have a good bit of, and Danny would have worked um, in terms of supplements too. So, um, you know, I would, in terms of having access to something like that, or again, if you have a test, um, you know, I do think, and I would have my own lactate pro and I would do that. But I think when you're doing your own testing like that and the field testing, it's great when the result comes out as you expect it to. But if it doesn't, it's important then to, you know, to have that. So certainly from that physiology point of view. And again, I've been very lucky that I, in my work with Athletics Ireland, you know, that I would have come across some really good um, physios and um, people like that that I would you know, have a relationship with that I've, I've had a problem that I could ring up and say, listen, here's what it ran. What do you think? Could you recommend somebody to me? And that type of thing. Gotcha. No, but that's, uh, yeah, you are, yeah, in, in a fortunate position. And uh, <laughs> I think Donegal might become even more popular <laughs> with the, uh, <laughs> with the, uh, the setup you've got there. Um, the, the next question was um, regarding uh, key areas for tapering and peaking for a competition. And, and maybe again, around about three things that, that, that you think are key that, that, that you really um you know you, you focus on during that you know is it one week yeah. two weeks three weeks when you're tapering for a big comp well i think it's, um and, and a word that i often use around a lot of things in coaching is and i, and I would kind of go specificity um and, and i think you know it very much depends on on the event and the discipline and you know so but but as a rule of thumb you know i'm definitely coming from the school less is more without a doubt sort of thing. like the work is done and that fine tuning sort of thing. like so um i think routine those last depending on you know again if we're, we're looking at that depends on whether what the goal is if it's you know a national competition or qualifying for a national competition or if it's an international or you're trying to had a standard to get selected on a team or whatever it is um you know i think that um you know you can have a huge amount of work done and everything can be have been right on cue to the last sort of kind of nearly week or the last two weeks so um you know i think that routine would be very important and my schedules would always reflect um training things that are nearly almost on the schedule just for the routine um you know things like you know, I would be inclined to maybe put on things like sets of strides with extra long recoveries or maybe one or two reps at race pace with load recovery. Just something that's kind of getting the athlete that on a Tuesday or the, or the Wednesday or the Thursday, they're still following the same kind of routine. Um, another thing that I'd be very much big into would be, you know, a checklist. Um, and it would, it would be very... Um, maybe holistic is the right word sort of thing because I would have everything on that and even down to things like um, contact with well-wishers, outside voices, telling an athlete their war stories maybe or what they think they should be doing and sort of kind of messing nearly with their head a little bit. Um, things like uh, I would always be very practical around hand washing, staying away from sick people the week of massive big competition and tapering and that sort of thing like 
alternatives to pass the time. I think it's very hard, particularly for, you know, you've been spending maybe an hour or 90 minutes, three times or four times a week training, and then all of a sudden you don't have to do. So my advice there is always things like the cinema, I think is always a really good idea. Um, if it's, if it's you know, um, students, I would be kind of saying, well, now, what can you be doing? Can you get, you know, get ahead of yourself now in your assignments or get ahead of yourself in your study? Or, And again, I would always advise them maybe to meet up with maybe non-running friends so that they're not talking about the race, they're talking about whatever, something like. Um, another thing that would always be in my taper, and that would be, um, you know, your practice and your warm-up, which you'd be doing very regularly. If it's something like a national championships and or an international you'd actually be doing a piece on the call room procedures where you would actually do a recce and go in and, you know, do your warm up, have it timed. You'd be sitting, you know, somewhere where you have to sit in the call room and replicating that. Um, I think too, what's very important to say, um, you know, like often we'll talk about the 80%, 20%, like in coaching is, you know, it starts off at 80% and put from the coach with 20% from the athlete. But I think in that sort of, particularly if it's a, uh, you know, your major goal for the year, the athlete then really needs to decide, you know, they can only decide, I can't decide if they're recovered from a session. And I think that's where important things in our tools are available and, um, you know, things like how they're feeling on a scale of one to 10 and that type of stuff is if they're ready for the session or, or not, particularly that last key session that you might do. And um, like, say, for example, the likes of Mark English, when I would have coached Mark, I used to do a power test with him and that would give you, you know, that would have determined then if he was recovered or not for, for a session, maybe. Um, the likes of, um, I think that specificity and specific risk preparations is really important as well too. And I think tried and trusted practices that you have used consistently and, you know, if you've had a bit of review put in place that you'd be kind of saying, well, I've learned that from the last time. So this is the way I'm doing it this time. Gotcha. Sorry, that was a very, that was a very long one to answer. Sorry. No, no, no. no. And, and the thing is, there's lots of gold dust there that you know a lot of people relate to, and a lot of people say, "Oh, I never thought about that before." But, but no, I think no, it was a comprehensive answer. But you know, it, it did uh, you know it, it hit, hit the pointers that I think you know perhaps one or two people might not have to think think about, or for one or two people are in that transition and they're just heading towards that. Um, they're going from national level to international level. You know, how are they going to cope? Well, if it works at national level. Why would it not work at international level? But you know, you know, why why change something if it's worked before? But but like you say, by being aware of the routines, then there might be a reason to tweak it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think too, actually, on that, it's, it's an interesting thing, and particularly maybe for coaches that it's it's very new for them, you know, to actually uh, uh, like for example, and again, I'm kind of wearing two hats there as being a team manager, but um, you know, I would always be, I would always know who. Um, the operations team manager is who the support staff is going to be so that and again I, I would advise any coach that say put an athlete to the first for the first time for an international find out what the process is because you know a few of an athlete going away to, to international competition there's a very um, there's a structured schedule there in terms of how things are done for the optimum performance of the athlete and to facilitate the athlete in the best possible way that you can and I think that can be very useful if you know the coach maybe hasn't experienced that before that it's a great idea to find out what that is and uh, so that you can work with that and you can have the athlete prepared for that process and that would be things like you know, um, you know what time you're going to be. Even things like you know, on the day of a competition, what time you're going to get up at. I believe I'm a great. I love lists, and I love to do lists. And what time are you getting up at? What are you going to have for your breakfast? What are you going to do in between times? How are you going to pass the time? What time? Where are you going to get your bus to the track? Or what time are you leaving for the track? What time are you going to start your warm up? And you know, all those types of things. I think is they're all very practical things, but they can be. If they're not done, they can leave a lot of ambiguity, and uh, athletes can get nervous. And yeah, I, I think in, in my experience, when I've worked with the team, sometimes I find that uh, personal coaches and parents uh, can get a lot more nervous than the athlete themselves. And sometimes, with them being around, they can actually add to the anxiety. So it's almost uh, preparing, you know, the people that might be in close contact with the uh, the high performer. Mm -hmm. How uh, how we're going to keep them calm or how we're gonna... yeah. And quite often, as you say, you have to be a buffer sometimes to sort of do that. 
you know, to protect. And I think that's where I believe in that, you know, I've never gone and discussed, um, waited until a competition um, internationally or nationally or internationally to discuss uh, tactics or to discuss how things you are. You might fine tune things, mm. particularly if say conditions change or if it's cross country, um, and you know, you after you obviously review after inspecting the course, but you know that to me is all done before you before you leave at all. And your role, if you're there as a personal coach with an athlete, your role is really there. You know, you're you're only needed if if things go wrong, or you're needed maybe to sort of kind of just be be that you know sense of 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 standing for anything else like yeah. yeah yeah no no I, I absolutely agree to that. Um, good, good, good. And and um, just um, for yourself, what do you do to wind down? You know, I mean, obviously you do athletics an awful lot, a big part of your life. But, but how does a, yeah. a a busy coach wind down? Get away from it. Well, I suppose I'm at the minute. I'm very fortunate because I'm, you know, I'm I'm retired. I I made a decision uh, that a lot of people maybe didn't agree with maybe at the time um, that I worked with, but um, you know, I would have worked full time and certainly. You know, work was always a very good balance to to athletics. And in 2010, um, I decided to take a redundancy package and and left my job. And uh, you know, so I suppose it's you have time now that you can do things. But for me, actually, funny enough, it would be um, I would at the minute I currently practice. I practice yoga most days, and you know, I could do 10 minutes one day, and it could be 50 minutes tomorrow. But um, quite interestingly. At times when I've been, and particularly around athletics, when I've been maybe stressed or needed something, yoga hasn't really found me or anything like But And I think two friends and a bit of fun. And, you know, I have a friend that I would meet most days for coffee and I have another friend that I would walk with quite regularly. And, um, you know, by the time we're finished, we often have the world put to rights. And I think that um, helps. And I think for me, another thing would be, I think it's what, what you just like and, yeah. I would be a, I like movies and, and I certainly would find that I would switch off um, from that and I do think that you need to I think like anything um, you know I would often describe myself as a coach you know you're you're also a performer and you know even when you work and particularly on even competition days you know your game face must go on and you you know you could be you could be a bit your stomach could be sick worrying about something or thinking about you could be nervous too but you know you must put on the game face and and you have to be calm and and open in that so I think it's very important as well to to have that built in and it's hard as a coach because the athlete goes on a break and you're then planning for the next season so I do think it's important you know in terms of your own self-practice is to actually have a break and you know you may not be able to have a big break but you would have small mini breaks throughout the year where you can even switch off for a day or a couple of days and um you know and, and for anybody that follows me on instagram you know i'm quite fond of the really force and then i go out with all the coastline and I, um you know i find great great sense of freedom on a beach and looking out on the water and waves and that so i think that's what 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 does it for you you know that could be it's individual it depends what you know you know, you're certainly in a great part of the world to check out the beaches. Uh, I've only been over there a couple of times, but uh, yeah, some of the best beaches Amazing, I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much for sharing that with me, um, uh, Teresa. That, that's been great. That, that there's lots of uh, gold dust to take from that, and, and I think lots of uh, um, lots of things that people can uh, relate to, but also at the same time, uh, hopefully, take away to, to help you know others improve their coaching journey and uh, be as successful as you've been. Thanks very much, Teresa.